I think the process of deepening economic ties between Panama and Dubai are a fundamental step in integrating the broader economic relations between Latin America and the Middle East. Panama and Dubai have very striking similarities and confluences in um, our economic models and our role in our respective regions. Dubai is a very important hub of trade, of uh, economic integration and uh, a, a culture as well as, well as tourism in the Middle East. Panama serves that same function for Latin America. Dubai is the gateway into the, the, the broader Middle East. Panama is the natural gateway for, for Latin America. Yeah. No, it was it was nice harmony. Well done. Thank you. At least there's outcome of that, right? Don't leave. Yeah. No. No. It's. Mike. 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 Mike is off. Yeah. Oh, where's my? Yeah. Right there. Check. Right Check. One. Two. Three. Check. The microphone. Don't leave. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Come back. We uh, just took a look at the complexity of looking at the global picture and how we have goods go from one region to the other. And it is a very complex issue. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper and discuss with uh, our two panelists, how does that look like in real terms? And uh, I wanted to, first of all, uh, introduce to you our uh, two speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, at the very end is Pedro Helbron, Chief, Exec Chief Executive Officer of, of Co Copa Airlines here in Panama. Lars Ostergaard Nielsen, he's a president of Latin America and the Caribbean for Merck's line. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Rafael Romo, I'm an anchor and correspondent for CNN and I wanted to thank you all for being here. Uh, we're going to start by taking a look at how much progress there's been in uh, say the last couple of years. I was uh, uh, taking a look at uh, some numbers here, uh, Pedro and, and Lars, and, and it's, it's very interesting to see how trade between Panama and Dubai has grown in the last couple of years, between 2016 and last year, it went from 21 million to 42 million. In terms of global trade, it's a minuscule amount, but the growth has been incredible. Um, and I wanted to start with you, Pedro, uh, because there's obviously a lot of growth. We were having a conversation earlier, and you t told me that as of yet, there are no direct flights between Dubai and Panama City. Are there any possibilities that in the near future this may become a reality? A very, very long flight. The logistics are incredible. But is there any possibility? Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot to begin no, with. No, it's okay. <laughs> it, it, it's okay. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I mean, if it happens, it, it won't be from us. Our planes can reach so far. Uh, however, we were very close to having a direct flight from Dubai. Uh, Ambassador Fonseca had a lot to do with that. And, and early in 2015, Emirates actually scheduled a flight between Dubai and Panama, uh, obviously thinking of connecting uh, their hub in Dubai with our hub in Panama, connecting all of Latin America, but mostly Central America and the UNPAC and the Caribbean. But at the same time, the economies went in the wrong direction early 2015, and the next two years, 2015 and 2016, were tough years, economically speaking. So that, that flight never happened, 
but I do think there's still an opportunity, still makes sense to connect those two hubs. Lovely when that happens, right? When there are plans and the mm -hmm. economy just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we were actually talking about this with uh, President Barella yesterday, and, and, and he said that his government is looking at the opportunity or the possibility of coming up with an alternative in which maybe there's a technical stop somewhere uh, before you connect the two cities. Is that more doable? Uh, and, and, and also give us an idea of if we have, say, an investor in Dubai today who wants to fly to Panama City, what would that take? Yeah, I would say they, they probably need to fly via a hub in Europe or the U.S. It's probably the better way of getting from the Middle East and Dubai to Panama. There, there are a number of alternatives, but nothing like a direct flight, nothing like a nonstop flight. When you have nonstop flight, a commerce, trade, tourism just shoots up and, and makes, I mean, it makes a big difference. So nothing replaces that. A, an indirect connection through someone else's hub is not the same. So I think there's an opportunity there. And I think, a, I think President Varela is not going to rest a, a, until he gets that or until he's, his government is over. But a, a, he's been very insistent on getting that flight here to Panama. Lars, sir, I wanted to talk to you uh, now because obviously everybody knows that Panama has the natural advantage of uh, having the, the canal and uh, having been in a, 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 an advantageous position uh, from uh, centuries ago uh, to be a conduit for many uh, countries in the world. Uh, and you are in charge of what happens to ships that come from Europe to this region, go back, and it was interesting to me in the informal conversation that we had before that you were telling me that from uh, Europe, uh, you have shipments of manufactured goods. And then from here, uh, you were trying to explain to me that we're talking about raw materials. And one of your colleagues interrupted and, say, and said, there's a whole lot of bananas coming out of this region. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to, it, it sounds simplistic, but uh, there's a lot of logistical questions involved and I wanted to uh, to ask you to give the audience an idea of how that trade is is uh, working out uh, right now yeah um, so, so perhaps a, a few points on, uh, on on Panama is important for uh, for a global shipping company like like the one I represent um, a, a big part of the the trade uh, in in Latin America as, as we talked about uh, ends up in Europe but certainly also in, in Dubai and the Gulf um, because of the, the nature of Dubai and, and the neighboring region, a, a lot of food stuff uh, has to be imported. Uh, and Latin America is, of course, the, uh, one of the places in the world where we, uh, where we produce uh, a significant amount, particularly of fresh fruit, but, but also of uh, there's fish coming from the south, there's protein uh, from Brazil. And a lot of that cargo uh, transits through the Panama Canal. Uh, so a lot of the fruit, we, we talked briefly about bananas, Ecuador being the biggest uh, banana uh, exporting country in the world. And, and most of those bananas comes up from Ecuador, passes through the Panama Canal, and then ends up in Europe uh, and in Dubai for that matter, actually. Um, so, so Panama and the Panama Canal has a, has a very important part of, of connecting world trade. Um, and that poses a, a kind of a logistical nightmare because obviously if you are exporting bananas from this region, uh, to other parts of the world, the same container that carries bananas cannot be the same container that would come back uh, importing uh, something like computers, for example. H how do you manage uh, uh, that challenge? No, so, so, so uh, it, it is very much a, a challenge. It's obviously not something that cannot uh, be overcome, but it, it comes at a, at a big cost. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the nature of trade between Latin America and the, the rest of the world essentially is such that the cargo that's being imported into the region is largely manufactured goods. It can be computers, electronics, uh, clothing, etc. Uh, and that would normally be imported in, in what we would term dry containers, whereas a significant part of the export uh, from the region here is in refrigerated containers, and they are two different container types. And that, of course, adds a lot of cost uh, and, and uh, complexity to, to running our business, which essentially means we have a lot of containers that are empty, in the wrong place, and we have to move them empty around the world. And don't mean to put you on the spot, but sure. does that mean that occasionally you have empty containers? 
That means we have uh, empty containers occasionally. Yes, that's correct. That probably costs <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> that, that of, of course, uh, shipping empty containers is, uh, is, is not a good business uh, since uh, the only one paying for that shipment is, is us. Uh -huh. Let me go back to Pedro. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, because in, in my capacity as a correspondent for CNN, I cover Latin America. Sometimes it's easier for me to get to just about any Latin American country from Atlanta where I'm based as opposed to being based in a Latin American country. And I wanted to ask you about growth opportunities for airlines uh, such as yours, and, and also the strategic importance of where Panama is located. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, this issue in terms of growth? Well, I think P P Panama would be the exception uh, to the example uh, you just shared. Uh, from Panama, there's more connectivity than from any other hub in Latin America almost by a factor of two to one. And it's actually a big reason why, I mean, Merck is a big player in the shipping industry, but Lars regional office could be anywhere, but it's based here. And I bet you it's based here because of the air connectivity that Panama and that we provide uh, here in Panama. So Copa Airlines serves about 80 cities throughout the Americas from Canada down to uh, Argentina and everywhere in between. And again, that's two to one and it's the engine of our growth, of the growth of Copa Airlines, but also the growth of Panama. International connectivity, hubbing, not only in shipping, but also in aviation and in, in other industry. And it's what we plan to continue developing, answering your question, to continue growing into the future. Obviously, uh, you would be a little biased uh, when I ask this question because you're Panamanian and uh, you are the chief of a Panamanian airline. But the title of Hub of the Americas, are you still, from your perspective, in competition with Miami, even though technically Miami is not in the Americas? Or can you proudly say that Panama City is the Hub of the Americas? Who okay. should that title go to? Or, or what city should that title so, go to? So, so it's a great question because when, when it's a great name, of course. You have to agree, right? Hub of the Americas. <laughs> and, and when, when actually it was my brother that came up with that uh, name. And when we came up with that name over 20 years ago, we were not really the hub of the Americas. But that was our aspiration. That's what we wanted to be. So we came up with that big, big name. And again, we were looking into the future. Well, we, were, we might be one day. I think today, and, and you know, I don't want to boast too much, but uh, we have earned we have earned the title. It's a title that we have to defend every day because there are other hubs that are competitive against Panama and that also want to be, quote unquote, the hub of the Americas. But as I mentioned before, in terms of other Latin American airports and hubs, uh, our international connectivity, it's higher by almost two to one. And that includes much li larger cities like Sao Paulo, Bogota, Lima, Mexico City, I mean, those cities are 10 and 20 times our size. And in terms of, compared to Miami, for example, I was uh, seeing a, a chart recently where in 2006, Miami had quite an advantage. By 2019 this year, in terms of uh, US to Latin America connectivity, we're very even in, 20, in 2019. So, so so, I, yeah, I think Panama deserves the name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have to talk to... Uh, <laughs> 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 it's the... Uh, those applauding is the Panamanian crowd, right? <laughs> no, it's everybody else. It's everybody else. I'm, I'm glad that people are awake. Uh, <laughs> now, let me go back to you, Lars, because we were ha having a very interesting conversation before, and you were telling me that uh, it's about 550 ships uh, that Maersk controls that somehow either touch Panama at one of its ports or cross uh, the canal. And I was asking you um, and trying to simplify this as much as possible, possible because definitely it's a very logistically complex question, but if the Panama Canal were a street, is that a, an empty street, a, a lightly congested street, or completely congested. I mean, I'm talking like 
standstill traffic. Yeah. No, let, let me, if you'll allow me one second first to, to just for the benefit of the audience, Petro and I have not talked about this before, but he made a comment before that there's a reason why my office is in Panama, um, and he is correct. Uh, it is largely due to the fact that we can cover the whole region based in Panama, because my business office did not need to be in Panama. My local business in Panama I is clearly a lot smaller than my business in Brazil or in Chile or in, in Mexico for that matter. Mm -hmm. but, but being here and having the hub that that COPA provides actually is a is a big uh, is a good big contributor. So so you're right, and and oh we right. didn't have this rehearsed. Um, <laughs> so so back to the question on on the canal. Um, so yes, it's correct. We we transit around uh, 550 times through the canal uh, every year as Musk. So either one or two ships on average every day of the year. Um, is the Panama Canal busy? Uh, is it a, a congested street? No, it's not. Uh, d d you know, with the second l locks and the second canal, as it's termed, uh, being inaugurated a few years back, then, then there's uh, plenty of capacity to have more traffic through the canal as it is today. So there's business and there's good business, but, but more can be done. And I wanted to ask you that question because I wanted to follow up with one that is related. So from your perspective, uh, as an executive uh, from Mer Maersk, what is the opportunity for growth the, the region has a lot to export to other parts of the world. Does that depend on the capacity of the canal to handle business, or does that depend on the commerce, the trade between the region as a whole and the rest of the world? I, I think the, uh, the, the canal can handle more trade. So, so uh, the business growth is, will be more linked to, to conferences like this, to people connecting and, and actually doing more trade uh, with one another than the canal itself. Uh, I, I think one opportunity for, for Panama still uh, is also to start linking, uh, and, and I think Dubai is a very good example uh, of, of how that can be done, of actually linking uh, the different modes of transport. Um, so, so today in Panama, on, on the Colon side, we have some connectivity between vessels, free zones, etc. Um, but I think with some of the new investments and plans in Panama, but certainly also linking ships to, to airplanes, uh, I think here there's more opportunities uh, that, that Panama can pursue and, and actually building more infrastructure and making sure that legislation and local uh, laws, etc., facilitates that, that you can more easily move cargo from one mode uh, to another. So I think there's, there's things, uh, but it's not necessarily the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. uh, so first and foremost, it's trade. And secondly, I think there's things we can do to, to link the different uh, modes of transport better. I wanted to go deeper on a question that uh, we were uh, dealing with before, and it's trade between uh, Panama and Dubai. Can you give us an idea of what kind of products are moving in each direction and how much are we talking about in terms of dollars? So, so I, I, I don't know the dollar value, uh, since that's something my, my customers will, will keep to themselves. Uh, some of the products that, that we can see moving, if we look at, at, at UAE or Dubai and Panama in isolation as, as individual countries, uh, Dubai manufactures a, a lot of uh, resin, there's uh, Dubal on the aluminium side, etc. So it's many, so it's industrial manufactured goods that, that can be imported, uh, and, and Panama has an ability to export, for instance, pineapples, uh, etc., so fresh fruit. Uh, that, that can move the other way. But, but it is relatively limited if we look at Dubai and Panama in isolation. If we think about Dubai and Panama as a hub, th then of course it's much broader because then all of a sudden Panama provides the opportunity to move cargo from Latin America, not only from Panama as a, as a country. And the same for Dubai for that matter, where Dubai is a hub for, for the Gulf and, and even for parts of Africa and the Indian subcontinent. So all of a sudden then you spread the, the, the opportunity to move cargo between the two. And so the main challenge uh, for growth in, in terms of trade between these two points, in your opinion, would be what? So if, if it's on trade, it, it's more to actually connect, uh, and I think the, the previous session was a good example in terms of actually connecting people via technology to actually trade with one another. Um, so that smaller trading houses uh, can find customers uh, and they can transact payments, etc. I think the more we can facilitate that, the more trade we will see. So I think the previous session was very good in illustrating that actually some of the, uh, the advances within, within the digital can actually help facilitate the, the growth of trade. Mm -hmm. But let me go back to you now, uh, because obviously uh, it, it, if there were to be a flight between uh, Panama City and Dubai, it would airline alone. It would depend on, number one, whether it makes sense from a business perspective and whether there's interest from other companies. Um, 
are there any conversations or is there any possibility that your airline may partner with say Emirates and between the two of you and, or maybe a third or fourth airline come together and make an agreement where this can happen uh, maybe not a daily flight maybe a weekly flight maybe twice a week uh, but I guess again the bottom line question is would it make sense economically speaking right well <laughs> we would have to partner for it to work and we did partner back in 2015 uh, if I'm not mistaken the agreement is still in place and it was a code sharing agreement which would would facilitate connectivity connections from Emirates uh, to the region uh, uh, so uh, sharing their code uh, on our flights so, so make it easier to connect to Central America the Caribbean and the and the impact I think that's in place still in place it took some time to secure the right from the other governments but that can be reactivated uh, quickly and we need to believe and Emirates needs to believe because they're doing the long haul so the the risk is really on their side so they're the ones that have to believe that there's enough business from the Middle East East from India maybe Southeast I Asia to this part of the world for that flight uh, to make sense and uh, you know a uh, business gets created and tourism uh, grows and and traffic comes out of nowhere when there's direct connectivity when there isn't well you know we're just that man where we are today so so I'm hopeful that, that flight could happen one day and that it should work it's yeah. it's a little bit like the question the question of what came first the chicken of the egg you need mm -hmm. the demand for the business to exist and the demand would create more business uh, so it goes that way right but you need to believe that there's gonna be demand sometimes there are cases where you know it's very difficult for a flight to work uh, so in this case I mean it it is risky I mean there has to be a reason why it was not done when it was supposed to be done and again the economies in our region are part of the formula it's important that that we are where we need to be in that in that respect and I think I think we're there so we'll see is it and this may be a little bit out of your area of expertise but I is there cargo traffic aerial cargo traffic between Dubai and uh, Panama City right now it, it would have to be developed and I think it can be developed and, it, and it's a critical part of making the flight work I, it was going to be a triple seven a triple seven three hundred that flight won't work if it doesn't have a belly full of cargo so that would have to be developed and as Lars mentioned it's not going to come just from Panama or just from Dubai it's going to come from the region and connect beyond Dubai to the rest of the region and so in the future um, and, and this is a question for for both of you let me start with you Lars uh, what is going to ensure other than the obvious which is the fact that Panama has the canal what is going to ensure that Panama remains a hub for the region so, so I think um, I, I think from from a shipping line perspective Panama is a hub in, in two senses I, it's a physical hub for us connecting cargoes as I mentioned, from parts of Latin America to the rest of the world and, and vice versa. And, and that, of course, Panama has a, a unique feature, which is the location. Um, and, and that, of course, won't change. You could argue that there are neighboring countries who have uh, discussed if they could rival the canal by building different uh, opportunities for connectivity. But I think that that aspect uh, Panama will most likely always have. You're talking about Nicaragua. That's one, and, and there's a few others uh, that, that have talked about other opportunities. So, so that's, but, but the benefit of location is really important for a hub. Um, I, I think the other aspects, when we think about our physical hub, uh, there is a notion of cost. Uh, we, we run a very, and I think unfortunately now he's left, but the previous speaker uh, managed to call my industry commoditized, um, and, and that is close to correct, unfortunately. So it is very much about cost. And, and Panama uh, needs to make sure that it stays competitive. Uh, to make sure that we facilitate trade. But the last thing uh, that, that really decides where a company like mine will place a hub is around uh, reliability and predictability. Um, so, so it's really important to, to maintain the, the predictability and the reliability. And that's in a broad sense. That's both in legislation, it's making sure that infrastructure works. Uh, because at the end of the day, if we have to build in, and, and I'm sure Petro has the same issue, if you have to build in a lot of slack, um, a lot of wasted time in your planning, then you become uncompetitive and, and it doesn't work. Right. 
Uh, so I think for Panama over time is to really make sure that the connectivity in a broader sense, so this is between customs, different uh, government entities, uh, and then potentially connecting also with, with airline capabilities, etc., etc. And you're confident that the government of Panama uh, will continue to give your company the certainty that you're talking about? That, uh, f from, from what we are hearing and from, from what we have seen, the government do absolutely. We, we're very happy with that. We, have a, we were talking about this uh, yesterday. That we yes. have a big election coming up. Yes. And so uh, sometimes in America, that changes things. But in the case of Panama, from your perspective, you're confident. From, so uh, so I'm, I'm sure whatever happened in the elections will, will, uh, will be a good choice by the Panamanian people. So I'm sure that will be the right thing for, for the country and, and hopefully therefore also for us. Uh, Pedro, the same question uh, goes to you. Yeah. Now, what is going to ensure that uh, Panama continues to be a hub not only for natural reasons, but uh, also for logistical and trade reasons in the future? Yeah. So maybe a similar answer. But first, I would say that, that we need to understand that we're not alone. Although Panama has a geographic advantage, and we've usually been ahead of the curve, there are other countries, cities, ports and airports, uh, trying to do the same thing and trying to do better. So for us to stay ahead, we need to make sure we have the right infrastructure, be it you know, another port in the Pacific, a second parallel runway at the airport, or whatever that infrastructure needs to be. Uh, for sure, make sure that we keep competitive costs. Because if, you know, if the countries around us do it better and have better costs, well, they're going to draw some business away from us. So, so being competitive in today's world where there are more options, I it's critical. We also have to uh, maintain that business-friendly environment where the laws and regulations make sense. If it's for multinationals, so what is needed for, for multinationals? Is it for logistic business? So sa same thing. And then in our case, the, the aviation hub of the Americas, it brings a lot to Panama, brings tourism, brings multinationals, etc. So we need to make sure everything else it makes Panama or keep, keeps Panama attractive and makes, it even, makes us even more attractive. So, so we can take advantage of the connectivity and again, bring more, more multinationals, bring more investment, bring more tourism. So there's a lot of other things that need to work well for all of this to continue growing. You were mentioning regulations. Uh, and again, that goes back to what we just talked with Lars, which is the upcoming election. Uh, are there any talks with the government? Will there be any talks about helping businesses such as yours keep a business-friendly environment for companies, not only in the transportation industry, but in general? I, our experience has been that, that pretty much every government understands the importance of air connectivity and logistics uh, for the country. Uh, so, so usually the, the laws and regulations that have to do with connectivity and logistics are going the right direction, uh, but sometimes we lack a uh, cohesiveness among the different, the different arms of a government, mm -hmm. the different ministries, the different, uh, 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 how you call, uh, you know, the legislative, the, the executive, the except. So, so th there needs to be a, a mo I mean, we have it. I mean, the, Panama has had an advantage over other countries for a reason. Is, I mean, we've done things right. The governments have done things right for a long time. So, so I'm not saying that we don't have that. But in a more competitive world, we need, to, we need to do even more of that. We need to do even better, which means we all need to be in sync and, and, and work towards the same objectives. We have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to close by asking you both, in, and nobody has the crystal ball, but in 10 years from now, the trade between Dubai and Panama is going to look the same as it does today, it's going to grow, it's going to diminish. Uh, give us about a one minute answer and tell us why. Uh, let's start with you, Pedro. Well, I say if Emirates, if we, if we can convince Emirates to fly direct nonstop from Dubai to Panama, I would say trade is gonna grow at least tenfold. Anybody from Emirates here? <laughs> 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 no? <laughs> well, we'll talk to them, we'll talk to them. Uh, go on. So uh, if I may, um, I think that uh, I've, I'm also convinced that trade will grow. Um, I, I think some of the, the digital advances that, that particularly the previous panel uh, discussed 
um, and some of the investments that a lot of us are doing uh, into trading platforms, into blockchain technology, I think that will facilitate a lot more trade. Um, so, so I'm convinced there will be more trade. And I think the example that Dubai Trade has said uh, that, that I think we can learn from in Panama as well of connecting the different uh, branches and activities uh, using digital technology uh, will help us a lot and that can connect the two regions as well. Our thanks to Pedro Hilbron, Chief Executive Officer of Copa Airlines. Pedro, gracias. Thank you very much. Lars Ostergaard Nielsen, President of Latin America and the Caribbean for Merck's line here in Panama. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both. Uh, and thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.